Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you so much for joining today's conversation. My name is Jocelyn Ramirez, and I am the chef and founder of Todo Verde, a plant based food business based here in Los Angeles. I'll talk a little bit about myself in just a moment, but I want to get right into the conversation. And again, thank you so much for Lexis sponsoring this conversation. I think it's a really important one. And in fact, I just learned that this is um, one of the first times that Chef's Feed Tastemade is leading a uh, conversation about food rather than an actual cooking class. So thank you all who signed up. Uh, I think that this conversation definitely needs to be happening more and more. So, ha so happy you're here. So this conversation is titled, They Don't Want Us to Eat Breakfast. And I think it's kind of an interesting title. Uh, um, uh, it's a comment that I really stuck to um, from a DJ. His name is DJ Khaled. Uh, and you may have noticed him really as a popular figure on social media a few years ago. And he had these videos that he was posting that were very much centered around like, they don't want us to succeed. They don't want us to be healthy. They don't want us to eat breakfast. Um, and really what stuck in my mind about that is this idea of, they don't want us. <laughs> they don't want us. And and something as simple as like, they don't want us to eat breakfast. Um, they don't want us to be healthy, successful, feeling well, um, all of the things. And so that really struck me as, um, something that we need to have a conversation about on a much larger scale. So let's get into uh, the next slide and into that conversation. And I welcome you to share any comments uh, um, or share anything within the feed and I'll be circling back to questions towards the end of this presentation. So let's get into the next slide. Okay. so. Just so you know a little bit about me and why I'm hosting this conversation, uh, I am this woman who grew up in Southeast Los Angeles, right? Um, which is known as a food desert in the city of Los Angeles. If you're not familiar with Los Angeles, obviously it's a it's a vast city. Um, and, and what's very prominent in the city is the difference between East Side, West Side, um, also people know South LA um, as being very different as well as uh, West LA. And so I grew up in Southeast Los Angeles, with this, which is a, a suburb in the Southeast and known as a food desert. And this area of the city was really made up of carnicerias, corner stores, liquor stores. In fact, there was a liquor store around the corner from where I grew up, which is where a lot of the kids in my neighborhood would go and buy chips and candy and all the things, right? Um, and then within walking distance, there was all these fast food chains available in our neighborhood. And it just was kind of a matter of fact type of thing. Nothing that anybody really talked about or thought about in a more critical way. Um, and so it was just a way of life. And my parents both worked full time. And my mother oftentimes worked overtime as well, too. So, you know, as the um, the main person in our household who was cooking, she would try to cook as much as possible. But then you can see a picture of me here also helping along in the cooking process, making tortillas at a very young age, which is what many of us in our family did, especially around family gatherings. But there were definitely those times where my mom was working overtime or extremely tired um, and picked up fast food on the way home. Uh, and our more healthy version of fast food was definitely at Boyo Loco Subway, you know, all these kind of healthier fast food chains. Um, and I, I was also a latchkey kid, a kid who came home from school and would uh, you know, open up a cup of noodles or a can of tuna and throw in like mayo and chile and all these things in there and was definitely, you know, eating a lot of processed foods growing up just to kind of keep going again without really thinking so much about it. And it wasn't until uh, I was in my adult years that I started to deal with health issues. And in me starting to really navigate through those health issues, did I start to kind of unveil all these other things that were happening within my immediate family. 
you know, obviously my, I knew that my dad had diabetes growing up and he uh, was diabetic from when I was probably as young as this, um, you know, me pictured here. Uh, but then, you know, my mom was on high cholesterol medication, dealing with high blood pressure. And then later on, my dad started to deal with cancer, not once, not twice, three times, now four times. Um, and so it was something that I really started to notice that was plaguing my immediate family. And as I started to have those conversations about our health and what we're doing to be healthier and to try to prevent some of these issues, did I start to see that our neighbors were dealing with the same things, that my cousins and my tias and my tios and all these other folks in my community we're also dealing with the same preventable health issues. And so for me, it made me feel almost desperate to try to figure out what we needed to do to change. And the thing that felt most attainable, most accessible to try to change, however, you know, it's still a little inaccessible, is the food that we eat and why we were eating so much processed food and how I really truly believed in that moment of time, in time, that that was really causing some of these underlying health issues that many of us are facing. So with that, many years later from that first uh, picture that you see there, that young kid to now, um, I decided to start my plant-based journey. I went vegetarian and slowly over time transitioned to become fully plant-based and have now started a whole business around it. And so I started Tolo Verde back in 2015 because I wanted to be able to um, not just create these um, family traditional dishes in a plant-based form that people would enjoy and that I can serve and feed and nourish my community and my family, but that we could also have these types of conversations that I think are super important uh, that we sometimes hear about in the news as just statistics, but here we are in real life. Here are the stories, here are the families who are impacted by these issues. And I think now more than ever during these times, um, you know, COVID-19 times where we're seeing black and brown communities of color, low income communities of color dealing with health issues at a rate that other communities are not. These are the types of uh, conversations that I want to bring to the forefront in the work that I'm doing with Todo Verde. Um, and then there in the middle that you, um, you'll you also see a cookbook, which I actually have here. Um, I published a cookbook last year as well, La Vida Verde, which is uh, 60 plant-based Mexican recipes that I wanted to put out there so that I can continue to share this food with people in their homes and really change the way people think about tradition and food. So I'm going to get much deeper into that. Uh, and we'll go ahead and go on to the next slide. But I wanted to give you a little bit of foundation of why, why I'm this person hosting this conversation. So the there's kind of four layers that I want to talk about that are kind of going over the general impact that we have on our bodies on the communities that we live in uh, and all these different people that we want to uh, kind of keep safe and out of harm's way, our planet and also our legacy and who we are gonna be um, you know, long after or how we will be remembered long after we are no longer here. So let's go into the next slide and start talking a little bit about the impact on our bodies um, in this idea of they don't want us to be healthy, they don't want us to eat breakfast. Uh, here are some issues that we're facing. I mean, I talked about, let alone like just my family dealing with cancer, heart disease, diabetes. This is something that is all too real in low income communities of color. And there's a lot of intersectional layers and factors that play into this. And you can see here just some facts, right? Like who named red meat a, a type two carnivore? You know, these are all things that you can definitely find information on more easily. But it's the question is why? Like, why do our bodies deal with such a risk of cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes? Is it because we mostly have all these fast food chains all these systemic kind of ways that our communities are made up of? Is it because there are, you know, liquor stores on every corner and not enough grocery stores? Is it because 
people are highly stressed working several jobs to make ends meet and don't really have time to focus on their uh, quote unquote, their self care. A lot of a lot of times we hear more and more people talking about I got to focus on my self care, especially now, right? We're dealing with so much, so many stressors right now. And many of us are, you know, stressed out because uh, work or we're working from home. But we have to think about those communities who don't even have access to that or never had access to this concept of what self care means, and how that is also what is causing some of these underlying issues of not being able to feel well in their own bodies. Um, for generations, black and brown bodies have been used for labor, right? Um, and so we don't oftentimes have that sense of, oh no, I should actually rest and take care of myself and nourish myself. And um, I think that especially in Mexican communities and like the community that I grew up in, there's a sense of resilience, a sense of we were, we are hardworking people. And I truly believe that. Um, but I wonder how much of that was really ingrained with the way that, you know, we were, um, and we, our labor has been used in this country and, and, you know, by folks who, uh, had the means to pay for our labor at a very low rate. Um, but all these underlying issues are definitely ones that cause these diseases to be plaguing our communities. And really, I want us to think about how do we reclaim our bodies and think about how do we uh, really regain health and bring it into our own hands. Let's go into the next slide. This is going to talk a little bit more about some of these statistics and health issues. If you have any questions about this, you can always reach out to me and I can share some of the data with you. And I'm not going to say that I'm, you know, a data expert in this area, but I'm, I'm plugging in some of this data to really share with you that this is a huge and real issue. Uh, and it goes beyond sharing the numbers and really about the stories behind what is happening with families who are dealing with losing family members um, at much younger ages than they should be, you know, um, leaving us and dealing with so many, um, and I don't want to get too heavy with it, but it is definitely something that we all have to consider. And so this picture that you see here, bad food is making us sick. I, I'm not at all uh, shaming like, you know, taqueros, food trucks, any of that. I mean, that's definitely what our communities um, see, especially working class folks who are um, working in a setting where they need to get food, food fast, um, where you want to be able to get your tacos, your burritos, something you can take on the go. Um, no shame in the game. But it's really interesting because I think for me as a plant based person, um, you know, now looking back in hindsight, like I was eating at food trucks and taquerias, all the time. And even at a young age, I started to feel like I was not feeling well in my body in my early 20s. And now looking back at that, it's just kind of like, wow, this, the way that we ate was um, not really centered around really uh, appreciating the food, really sitting down and thinking about like how uh, we convene in community and share food together. It's definitely become like this quick, fast, passing, uh, gotta go, gotta eat um, kind of mentality around food. And it's making our bodies not feel well. So we're dealing with things like obesity, uh, we're dealing and that then turns into other issues like diabetes, um, other issues like high blood pressure. And these things are really some of the factors that are causing more amplified issues within our community. So let's go into the next slide. I want to talk a little bit about food deserts. Uh, food deserts is one term that is oftentimes used for communities that have a lack of access to food, <laughs> to grocery stores, to farmers markets, to places where they can get healthy food. Uh, that's one term that's used. Other terms that are used as well are food swamps. Um, 
So a food swamp, for example, is a place where, yes, there is definitely a good amount of food accessible, but it's not the good kind of food that you want to eat. It's definitely fast food, maybe lots of food trucks, a lot of taquerias and things like that. So it's not fruits, vegetables, um, food that has not been highly processed and things of that nature. So that's what some people also call areas like East LA, like South LA could also be called food swamps. There's also terms like uh, food mirage. Uh, and that's really interesting if, you know, if you're in a city like Los Angeles that is dealing with a lot of gentrification, a food mirage is um, a concept where you may have been in a neighborhood for a really long time and there's changes happening all around you and there there may have never been a um, you know a good quality grocery store or um or a farmers market or something like that in your neighborhood but all of a sudden there is one now there's a great health food store with lots of grade a produce and things available but it's completely out of your price range uh, it's not really calling to you as the original community member of that area of that land it's calling to whoever the new um, kind of gentrifying community is and so that's called a food mirage because you can see it and it's there but you can't touch it it's not it's not for you um, and so that is another term that's oftentimes used for these communities and one thing that we see is you know just in terms of looking at supermarkets is that predominantly white neighborhoods have three times as many supermarkets as black neighborhoods and two times as many as Latino neighborhoods, which is insane. And the uh, there is definitely more density in communities of color. You might have one household that is, um, you know, where there are maybe two or three times as many people living in one household that you might see in a white household, um, or there's a lot more apartment complexes. So there's a lot more density and people living in black and brown communities, yet there's way less grocery stores than there are in white communities. And then when you also look at the difference between those types of supermarkets, I mean, you're talking about a food for less versus a pavilions, a Whole Foods, a Trader Joe's. Uh, you know, it, it's just definitely a stark difference between the quality of ingredients, um, accessibility to organic ingredients, as well as um, the the grade of the produce. So we might see, you know, the more affluent neighborhoods getting very beautiful quality grade A produce, whereas the a uh, low income community of color supermarket may have something that is more like a grade C. So sometimes you even see some of the produce that didn't sell in more fluent neighborhoods will then get shipped over to uh, a community of color a supermarket there um, where it may be sold to that community. Let's head into the next slide. And so I think that the main thing is really thinking about this issue as a one kind of intersectional layer of many. Uh, many times I like to, when I have these types of conversations, I like to ask the question or pose the question that if we were able to change every liquor store like the one that i mentioned earlier that i grew up going to all the time and getting all my candy and chips from if that turned into a healthy shop maybe a juicery or um you know a fruteria or whatever it may be if that if all of these corner stores changed into health food hubs across our neighborhoods would people actually show up and be excited about it? Would they shop there? Would they, you know, would I, would I change my, um, you know, gummy uh, sweet and sour candies to an apple? Probably not, uh, because there are so many intersectional layers to this, and it really um, means that we have to tackle a much larger conversation to hone into this food accessibility conversation. And it's also going to take a lot of undoing and unlearning of what 
good food and the palate enjoys in the process, but I'll talk about that in just a few slides. So when we talk about elements of a healthy community, I mean, food accessibility, as you can see there on the bottom left, is definitely a huge factor. But there are so many other things, like the way the community is designed. Is it walkable? Do people feel safe and comfortable? Are there parks in their neighborhood? Is there green space or is it mostly, as folks call South LA, a concrete jungle, right? Uh, is there some sort of areas where people can really integrate into cultural social issues and have conversations about it? it does it feel like it's an area that really integrates social justice in the way that they create these types of spaces for community members? Is there access to transportation? Many pe people of color are, are using tra public transportation to get around to go to work to literally drive across town to their job. Uh, access to care, um, medical attention, and also access to, um, to child care too, which is a huge factor. Um, and you know we can go on and on about all these different things. I mean, access to good quality housing is huge. And you know, right now what we're seeing with everything going on with COVID, people are worried about rent, um, being able to just keep the housing that they currently have. Um, so that is a huge issue that we have to bring into consideration. All of these things, being able to create safe, vibrant, thriving communities where this idea of wellness is integrated into every single element of this community, where then this idea of food accessibility and being able to eat healthy doesn't become this far-fetched um, concept, but really becomes a part of this lifestyle that just makes sense because there, everything else is being super, um, is, is very thoughtful in the way that somebody lives their life, that feels safe, that has all the necessities and the amenities and the resources that every community should have. Let's move into the next slide. Now, talking about our planet, right? Because we were talking about our bodies, the issues that our bodies are facing when they don't want us to eat breakfast, when they don't want us to feel healthy in our bodies, things with our, you know, our, that our community face that impact everyone as a whole in these areas. But now moving on to our planet, and I just wanted to put these numbers out here because I think that the number one question that I get as a plant-based person, even somebody who's probably vegetarian gets this all the time, is where do you get your protein? I can't tell you how many times I've heard that question, especially as a chef, right? People are like, okay, I see what you're doing. It seems cool. It tastes good. But where do you get your protein? <laughs> and um, And I love putting this out here because you know, we are able to fulfill that need, that necessity that, um, you know, with so many other elements that we can eat. And in fact, we don't need that much protein to survive and to feel well in our bodies. Um, so you can see here at the bottom, we only need 56 grams per day for a sedentary man, 46 grams a day for a sedentary woman. And you can see the amounts of grams that you can get from plant-based ingredients and um, and how much more you need from beef and milk um, to and how much water goes into that. So this is really looking at the impact of water consumption with animal products and the water consumption with plant-based products and how much you need per grams of protein. And it's so silly in Los Angeles, we're known as a drought area. And oftentimes what I hear is don't take long showers, don't wash your car, don't water your lawn this many times a, a week because we're in a drought and we don't have that much water. Um, but really, no one really talks about the water consumption used in the animal agriculture industry and how that really impacts our well-being of the planet. Um, you know, so water is something that I think in not too far off from now and years to come, we're going to have a huge issue with. I mean, it's already a huge issue, but I think that if people really think about plant-based eating as a way that we can conserve some water and still feel like we are getting all the things that we need, all the nutrients that we need to survive and thrive in our bodies, 
then it doesn't become such a huge issue. Let's head into the next slide. And the other things related to our planet are just obviously the greenhouse emissions, aside from water consumption that animal agriculture creates in our atmosphere and is really damaging to the planet, as well as obviously we talked about the, the water footprint. And we're seeing now people transition to different things. Like I hear so many people who are like, oh, I'm gonna go pescatarian or I'm trying this other route to kind of diminish the amount of red meat that I'm eating. And that may be for health reasons, it may be for uh, sustainability reasons, whatever it may be. But because you know everyone's kind of flocking to that next trend, it doesn't necessarily um, make it so that, you know, everything just ends up being awesome and great and it just works out. We then go and uh, move on to really degrade other other areas of the planet that um, that will really harm our ecosystems. So something to consider is that, you know, our, our world's oceans could be empty of fish by 2048, which is insane. It's, you know, within some of our lifetimes, right? Well, hopefully most of our lifetimes. <laughs> I'm like, that's not too far off. Um, and then of course, less deforestation. Um, one of the things that is, is uh, um, one of the ingredients that I've been talking to more and more people about is aside from the deforestation that happens, I mean, we saw all the fires, uh, you know, there continue to be issues with fires across the world in rainforests that are because typically people are creating more space for animal agriculture to happen. But, you know, it could be something as simple as, uh, uh, an ingredient that seems harmless, like palm oil. And we're seeing more and more of that deforestation happening. Um, instead of having a monoculture of, of plants and trees growing, we're seeing, you know, uh, sorry, a polyculture of plants and trees going. Now we're seeing a monoculture of just palm trees that are used for the oil that we need to consume several products. And so that is really damaging to our ecosystem as well, too. And so you know, one thing that I want to talk a little bit about further is, you know, at what point do we say enough is enough and we don't need to have all these things for us to, uh, again, feel well in our bodies, feel like we're thriving, feel like we are, um, you know, happy in the things that we consume and we eat without feeling like we need to have these things every single day in our diets, right? And the question I like to pose for folks as we talk about our legacy in the next slide, if we can transition to the next slide, is how do we want to live our life in a way that we are walking as if we are kissing the earth with our feet? I love this quote by Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, you know, how do we walk delicately through this earth and that we bring less harm to it and that we worship it and that we um, care about our choices and how they impact the lives of not just other humans, but other animals and other species. It could be plant species and how that really plays a part in the bigger ecosystem. But I think the bigger question here that I like to ask people is, how will we be good ancestors? Um, you know, I think a lot of times when we think about the past and how we've gotten to the point where we're at now of overconsumption as humans. Um, how will our legacy be one where we feel like we can leave this earth and be great ancestors to those who are coming after the after us, whether they're our own children or the communities that we participate in? Um, how will we leave this earth in a way that is, you know, better kept than the way that we came into it? Um, and it's really, for me, walking as if you are kissing the earth with your feet, walking lightly, being thoughtful in all the things that you consume, that you do, um, the places where you purchase things, um, who you're purchasing from, S so many things that are considerations for us um, to really be at the foundation of who we are as a people and how we support the things that we want to see thrive for years and years, decades, centuries to come. 
let's move into the next slide of our legacy here. So this is one conversation that could be its whole own conversation. Um, thinking about our legacy is decolonizing foodways. I was just telling the folks who are hosting that we should have a whole conversation about decolonizing. Um, this is one that's super important and impactful for me. In fact, the reason that I went plant-based was because I, I went to a um, indigenous veganism workshop led by my now mentor, Claudia Serato, and her work is all really based in decolonizing foodways. And it's really this concept of, you know, us engaging beyond like, how do we get the food that we eat? But how do we then make it make sure that it's a platform for us to engage in, um, in our culture, in our traditions, in the policies around food access and who has them. And the just like the economic climate of food. And again, who has the accessibility to be able to purchase some of these ingredients. And so, you know, with decolonizing, really it's this idea of, you know, in our current urban society that many of us live in, we may not ever be able to go back to the way that things were, but how do we in today's society use those enseñanzas, those teaching of our teachings of our ancestors to really integrate into our lives today. Um, because there was a lot of knowledge there. There continues to be so much knowledge there that will help us in our ongoing legacy as a people. And it may be something like being able to um, cultivate the land, connect with the earth and the land, grow our own food, share that food with others, um, cook uh, from a place of, um, abundance and vibrancy of fresh produce that um, that is really nourishing to the body versus um, something that you just need to eat to get by through your busy day. Um, a, a, a moment where you can sit and connect to a bowl that's ancestral, like the one that you see here pictured, which is pozole, it's pozole verde. Um, how can you create a space for you to appreciate that bowl of food in front of you. Uh, one exercise that I like to do, or I guess the word is exercise, um, that I like to do with folks when I do these types of conversations, especially if we are sitting in front of a plate of food, is thinking about all the hands that touched that food for it to become this nourishing bowl that's sitting in front of you. And it may be hundreds of people. It may be, you know, folks who planted the seeds, folks who nurtured those seedlings, people who harvested, uh, folks who transported it, who, you know, did whatever they need to do to process it, whether it's like peeling, chopping, whatever, put it on the grocery store of your shelf, check you out at the grocery store, um, you know, and then that's just one ingredient. Think about all the ingredients to get to that place. It could be hundreds of people who played a role in in every single meal that we consume and so it's a matter of sharing that gratitude of thank you thank you everyone thank you community of people who are feeding us um because i think a lot of times we don't sit down and really appreciate how much hard work goes into every single plate of food that we eat so really decolonizing is coming back to that way of life as much as you know, possible as much as makes sense for people, as much as feels feasible. Um, but really thinking about, again, how do we keep that ongoing legacy and the enseñanzas, the teachings going as we become elders, as we, um, you know, have kids or help teach the kids in our communities? How do we keep that going? Let's go into, I believe this is the last slide here. And, you know, I know I went all over the place. I feel like this concept of, you know, they don't want to see breakfast. There's so many layers to it. It's definitely a social justice layer. It's definitely accessibility. It's health issues. It's coming back to what was and how that worked and how we can come back to it. Um, you know, for the decolonizing, one thing that I didn't mention is that 
you know, my abuelitos, they grew up in Mexico and they migrated here as, as older adults once most of my family migrated here to Los Angeles. And they lived to be 96 and 99. And I'm sure that may be true for many of you and your grandparents, but I can't say the same would be true for our parents um, because assimilation has happened and people ate differently here than they did maybe in their home countries. Um, and so there has to be a lot of knowledge there in the way that our grandparents ate or our great grandparents um, as compared to maybe how our parents ate who migrated and started to live a life here um, in the United States. So I'm going to get to the questions that are coming up in just a second. I mean, the last things the takeaways that the, the action items would be for all of us to be more critical about the food that we put into our body and how you know, we want something because it tastes good, because it's exciting, because it's a new trend in food, whatever it may be. But I like to think about it about how this, you know, this tongue that we have, this like little muscle in our body that craves a flavor, that wants to feel that texture, taste, whatever it is, um, and how that really controls everything else that's happening in our body. Um, it seems <laughs> it seems so silly, right? Um, we should really be thinking more critically about not just the food that we consume, but also like what we put on our body topically, um, what we consume on TV and the internet, like just really being more critical and mindful about all the things that could be potentially become stressors in the body and how we want to be able to be more um, focused on our wellness. Uh, planning and prepping meals. I mean, this is huge. It's one thing to say that we want to be better in all these different areas. And another thing to take an action and be like, I'm going to actually have the food prep so that, you know, I don't have to eat out all the time, or I don't have to, um, you know, n eat all these processed foods, because I'm I only have 10 minutes now between meetings or whatever it may be really taking the time to focus on how do you create a space that is like nurturing and nourishing for you all around. And that's planning and prepping meals. It's really important. Choosing where you spend your dollars wisely. So one thing that I mentioned, especially for younger folks, like if there's anybody in here who's like under 18, for example, I always like to say that, you know, you may feel like your voice only counts to a certain extent, like you're not able to vote, you know, or maybe that you, you don't have access to all the things that slightly older adults have access to, but dollars is really uh, our everyday opportunity to vote, to vote for the things that we want to see thrive in our communities. If you want to see that farmer's market, maybe there's that like new farmer's market in your neighborhood that is intended for people in your very own community, guess what? use your dollars there because that's the only way it's going to stick around. Support that small uh, store that opened up that is trying to create more healthy options for the community. Support, you know, uh, any of the small businesses there that are really focused on, focused on uplifting um, these conversations and really care about the health of the community. So really choosing your dollars wisely and where you want to see people stay, stay in your community for the long haul. And then of course, avoiding food waste, which I didn't really get into in this conversation. But I think I always have to throw that in there because food waste is such a huge issue that's affecting our planet. Um, you know, we, we get rid of so much food all the time, like there is definitely enough food to go around enough good food to go around for everyone. But we see so much food wasted and so much abundance. Um, and it's really unfortunate. So definitely trying to think through how do we become more intentional about using every part of the plant. Um, and I'm sure there's more classes like that that'll come up through these platforms, but also making sure that we share food, um, which is something that we don't often see. Like here, I'm cooking all the time as a chef, I'm doing all these classes and testing recipes. And I have an overabundance of food, but guess what? My neighbors love me because I share that overabundance of food with them all the time. And I'm getting folks who are not plant-based to say, wow, I never thought something like this could be tasty. And here it is. It's, it's actually really delicious and I want to eat more of it. So I'm getting people interested in eating more plant-based food.
Um, I'm gonna take a look at the questions that are coming in. I'd love to answer some of these. Um, yeah, definitely. Otis here saying, never heard the fact about fish before. That's crazy. I mean, just all around. We're going to see more um, factory farming of fish happening, which is not the greatest way to um, produce fish. And I'm hearing more people who are interested in doing things like um, eating jellyfish, for example, rather than, you know, a fish that we typically see. So starting to eat other sea animals. Um, that maybe feel like it's it's less of a impact a negative impact on the planet but it's so so crazy uh, how can we start to curb all the overuse of, um, of the planet when people seem so entrenched in in these ways and that are so destructive i mean i know that it feels sometimes a little bit hopeless you know in such a crazy world and you know I think that 2020 has really been like an unveiling moment for many of us to see all the injustices and all the ways that we overconsume. Um, I'm pretty sure that many of you, especially folks who are working from home, like how often are you like wearing all the shoes you even have in your closet? You probably have like two to three pairs of shoes on rotation and that's it. And then it's like everything else is overconsumption, right? Um, I think it's a matter of us on an individual level realizing that and trying to figure out like how do I um, start to make different choices in my life that maybe other people will notice maybe they won't um, but it's really about you as an individual versus thinking about like how do I change everybody else I mean it's it's tricky right like even me sharing here it's like I'm just trying to give you my story and information and hopefully connect with you in a certain type of way um, but not necessarily saying like, you have to change, like you have to do this differently. Um, I'm just trying to think about like how I, as a person, um, you know, as I'm thinking about making an impulse purchase, like how do I really change that mentality? And like, do I really need that? Is there a way I can, you know, get by without that? Is it a necessity? Is it a need or a want? Um, and then really trying to integrate that into my circle, into my family and my friends. Um, just letting them know that this is the way of life that I choose to live and seeing if that can then somehow become impactful for them. And that's really what it's been like for plant-based. Um, I didn't force anybody in my family to become plant-based and not they're not all 100% plant-based, but I would say that they're about 80% of the way there. And that is huge. And it wasn't because I forced it. It was because I just like to have these conversations and people are thinking about it more uh, and are trying to kind of curb the way that they think about food as well. So it's really about us just living our lives in a more, I guess, more positive way and, and hoping that that radiates to somebody else who may be watching. Um, let's see here. I need to be more mindful of all, all the work that goes into my food. Definitely take it for granted. Absolutely. I think we all take it for granted. Um, I first heard that concept in uh, my master's program uh, of like thinking about all the hands that touched our food. And, and it was really coming, uh, my professor was really coming from this angle of like, as Americans, especially, we tend to be very individualistic. And we tend to believe that you know, this is my life and I have my views and this is how I feel. And like, it doesn't really matter what else people think out there because it doesn't, I don't impact these other people. When in reality, everything that we do impacts everyone else. I think that 2020 hopefully <laughs> um, has shined that light a little bit more brightly um, in that, you know, somebody else's actions can impact easily, you know, create a chain reaction of other impacts, uh, a bigger impacts on other people's lives. So, you know, we have to really think about, you know, the, the farmers, every single person who is uh, touched and impacted by our everyday, super simple choices, super, super simple choices. What can we do to help bring more fresh foods into these uh, desert food swamp neighborhoods? I think that's a great question, Otis. I, I think that what we can continue to do is have these conversations, advocate for better policies. Um, Cause I think a, a big issue is, you know, even if we wanted to bring more of these things into neighborhoods, which I think a lot of people do, 
where is the funding for it? Where is the action from, you know, even our top leadership to say, this is a serious issue, I recognize it, and we're going to invest dollars into this neighborhood. We are gonna invest in this community. And so I think that, that there is a lack of that community investment. Um, and, it, and also um, maybe perhaps, I don't wanna say lack of leadership, because I think there's a lot of really amazing leadership happening in a lot of communities of color, people stepping up who are from those neighborhoods who are saying, we need this change. But I think that, it becomes very um, heavy. It's a heavy weight for a lot of people to carry. For so many people, it's really building up people and giving people access to uh, a seat at the table where decision makers sit. Um, I think that that's really where we're going to start to see the bigger shift. Is like, you know, once somebody from my neighborhood who has seen these issues and like several of us start kind of stepping up and being at that table, we're big decisions get made that's where we will start to really begin to see the changes happening because right now if like we're not at the table these decision makers maybe they see the numbers like i was showing you earlier they see they see the statistics but unless they've lived that reality they will never truly understand unless they hear my story other people's story and give us the platforms to truly share what is going on in our neighborhoods then we will start to see more of a bigger impact happening in those communities. So it's really the biggest thing is like um, training leaders and changing policies and funding all of it, paying people to do this work because many of us do it just because we care deeply about it and not because anybody is paying us to do it. So that is a big shift that needs to happen people get burnt out from organizing so much. Um, any recommendations on an effective, easy way to meal prep? Sometimes, okay, so this is a great question. Um, I think that what I recommend is like, maybe some people try to do it all at once. Like I hear people who are like, Sundays for this many hours, I do meal prep and that works fine for them. Other people may not even have like that big old chunk of time to meal prep for the week. Um, so I just, I, I recommend trying to break it up in whatever way makes sense for you and like carve out that time on your calendar. Like if you look at your calendar, carve it out, carve it out and like be really specific about like what things you're also going to do during that time. Um, whether it's, you know, I'm going to, you know, cook, roast all my vegetables. Let me roast all my vegetables so that they're already in the fridge roasted and I can easily pull it together to make meals happen. Let me make, for me, sauce is the boss. So have salsas. What I usually have like two, at least two salsas in the fridge at all times. Like I'll get tomatoes. I have some tomatoes right behind me right here. Um, I keep pointing at myself. It's like the other way. Um, I usually have salsas, some sort of creamy sauce, something like that, where I can like easily pull together a meal. And it could be like the same roasted veggies, the same arroz or frijoles or whatever, but it feels different every time because I have different sauces available. So, you know, I just recommend just carving out that time, getting creative with uh, the different things that you prep, whether it's different grains, just to make it seem exciting um, from week to week, and then different, slightly adjusted or different sauces. That's kind of my trick. And then roasting or sauteing, like I have a big old container of um, sauteed mushrooms. And I just like sprinkle, like, let me make noodles and sprinkle mushrooms. Let me make tacos with mole in, with the mushrooms, right? Um, and so every meal feels slightly different, even though I'm using some of the same ingredients to cross over into different dishes. Let's see here. One more question here from Irma. Let's see, support brown farmers at the farmers markets. Absolutely, I uh, speak with your speak with farmers market managers to bring in more farmers that look like you at your nearest farmers market. Absolutely. And the other thing that I didn't mention when I was talking about the dollars and how our dollars are kind of like our votes and the way that we can create a bigger impact on a daily basis is, I've heard this from several people where they're like. I don't really like to shop at farmer's markets because it's the same price as if I go to the grocery store, like the produce costs the same. And that may be the case. But I think what's really important to think about is that a lot of times these farms are family run. You'll literally see like the father, the son, the brothers, the sister, whoever it is, it's like a family 
owned and operated business. And when you pay them that money, that money goes directly to that farm, to that family. When you buy it at the grocery store, you're paying the grocery store, which gives a smaller cut to the um, to the farmer. And so, you know, yes, of course, that does help the farmer if they're really producing at a larger scale. But at the farmer's market, you're getting like better quality produce, produce that was probably picked within the last couple days versus, you know, weeks in advance. Um, some of these things are being imported from uh, South America, Australia, like we import oranges from Australia. And we're, you know, we have Orange County, <laughs> right? It's literally called Orange County because we grew so many oranges. Um, and so it's just interesting to see like, how we consume food, think about it as like trying to diminish your footprint and that you are supporting something that was um, grown locally. There's like le less emissions created in transporting those goods to you. And you're also doing your part to make sure that those farmers are economically supported. Let's see, any advice on how to educate people about proper food choices when the lack of access is, uh, to adequate grocery stores? Yes, that is a huge one. And again, this is why it's such a bigger issue is that, you know, here I am talking to folks about how to eat more plant based and I publish this cookbook. But some of us live in areas where you can't even access some of those ingredients in your very own neighborhood. And so it's an issue. It's an issue. You have to really help people navigate through that or help them purchase online. Maybe they've never purchased online or whatever it may be, or it's an expensive ingredient. And so it's it's really it's really tricky. And one of the things that I aim to do with Dolo Verde is to um, open up spaces that are community-based hubs where people can come and eat, but also purchase some of these ingredients and have these types of conversations and cooking classes um, so that this could become more of a lifestyle shift versus just a plate of food that you come and enjoy once in a while. Um, but I think the other thing that you can do to kind of just help encourage people is um, what worked for me, I will say, not that you need to necessarily do this, but what has worked for me is that I was really the person who in our family specifically was showing up to every gathering, every holiday celebration, birthday party with food, with plant-based food. And, um, and slowly with like more options, like two or three dishes, now making almost the full meal, except for the one thing that has meat in it. Um, and so I really started to take over those um, meals and use it as an opportunity to just share delicious food with people. And in fact, you know, some of my family members started getting really excited and asking me for recipes and, oh, she's going to make this and that this time or whatever it is. And so that slowly starts to get them more excited about seeking out the recipes, the ingredients, making it at home, sharing it with their friends and other family members. Um, and so it's a matter of you just being that vehicle of like, here it is, try it. I'm, I hope you like it. And when they do, because hopefully they will, um, then it kind of opens doors for other opportunities for them to get excited about it. It's really about them getting excited. And once they do, they want to share it with other people. Um, and then I see Erin here saying that you're a nurse and I often find it hard to help my patients live healthier lifestyles when the resources aren't available. That's tricky because you're not necessarily going to be providing food per se for your patients. Um, but I think that one thing that I've been trying to do, especially my dad is, as I mentioned, has been dealing with cancer for several years. And um, he wasn't always like a firm believer of advice that I mentioned to him. But I linked him up with the nutritionist. And um, and now that we're seeing her on a regular basis, in fact, I have a meeting with them later this afternoon, virtually. Um, and so now my dad's like, okay, here's somebody who's like, literally an expert in this area, um, who's like a trusted source, I will take their advice, because they don't always take the advice of, you know, a family member, somebody who obviously cares, but maybe they don't see as like, uh, expert in the area. So I mean, trying to connect them to resources of people who could be considered experts, especially in the Latino community, um, for me seems to help, because then they kind of take it as more of like a authority figure on the topic. 
So I don't know, just something to to consider for sure. Um, and if you ever want to like print out recipes for people, things like that, that always is like a nice touch to see if they might be interested in making something. All right, I think I covered all the questions here, unless you have any other questions. I wanna thank you all so much for joining today. Um, you know, I, again, I know that I covered a lot of different topics in a, kind of a short amount of time, but I think for me, it's always a matter of um, trying to find out like what those sort of points of interest may be for people because like I mentioned earlier, like this concept of like, they don't want us, like they don't want us to eat breakfast. They don't want us to be healthy, to feel um, well. For me, it's a matter of connecting with like, what is it that that person is most passionate about? Is it social justice? Is it food accessibility? Is it health issues? Is it, um, you know, our legacy and our impact on the planet? Um, and then being able to really move forward with that in a way that seems more sustainable. So again, I wanna thank you all who, who joined and who were asking questions, sharing comments. I really appreciate it. The other last kind of things that I wanna mention is, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, I published a cookbook last year called La Vida Verde, and we have been really shifting to virtual offerings. And so for the last almost year now, we've been in this crazy COVID time for almost a year, um, we've been doing online cooking classes. We've been doing um, them on our platform uh, on Zoom. We've also done some on Chef Speed and we have a couple classes coming up. Um, we have one coming up that's plant-based staples where I'll, I'll literally be talking about all these different vegan staples that I have in my pantry that I use on a regular basis to make sure that I'm meal prepping, getting all the flavors out and making them really exciting meals all the time. And then there's also an actual cooking class where I'm gonna show folks how to make a melty, gooey, plant-based cheese to make quesadillas con vegan chorizo. So we'll be making the cheese and the chorizo in that class. Um, and then we have a bunch of other classes. So please definitely check those out. And we also do private classes if you wanna share these recipes in a private setting for birthdays, celebrations, whatever it may be. And the last thing I'll share for you all to look out for in the next couple months is we will be starting to launch some spices, some seasoning and culturally relevant flavors on our website and hopefully in grocery stores soon. So that's sort of the next phase of Todo Verde is to continue to provide more of these um, flavors that feel very much rooted in our culture uh, that are more and more accessible to people so that they feel like it's not that hard of a shift to make a leap to plant-based. So thank you all again for joining. Thank you to Lexis for sponsoring this conversation and, and the invitation to join you all today. Hopefully see you all soon.